you've probably heard of 32-bit numbers and you've probably heard of 64-bit numbers, but what about 128-bit numbers? Do we use those today? Do they actually have a use in our modern computing? Hello there, my name is Gary Sims and this is Gary Explains. Today I'd like to talk about the magic of 128-bit numbers. So if you want to find out more, please let me explain. Okay, hey, first of all, if you want to find out more about 8-bit numbers and 16-bit numbers and so on, I do have a video dealing with those uh, here on this channel and I'll leave a link to it in the description below. But let's just say quickly that a byte is an 8-bit number and then after that we have 16-bit numbers which are 2 bytes, we have 32-bit numbers which are 4 bytes and modern computers of course use 64-bit numbers which are 8 bytes. But we don't hear about 128-bit computers, or do we? Well, let's have a look at three different places that actually we use 128-bit numbers all of the time. Now, the first one of those is actually the idea of a universally unique ID, a UUID. Now, UUIDs are made of 128-bit numbers, and they are very, very interesting because there is no central organization to dish out these unique numbers but yet they have some properties, which means that actually, if you generate a UUID, it's actually gonna be fairly sure it is a unique number. Now, this is done in one of three different ways. First of all, it can actually be just completely random. So a random number is picked across 128 bits, so that's across 16 different bytes, and the chances of my randomly 16 byte number to your random 16 byte number, the chances are the same is actually uh, very, very small. In fact, here are some interesting statistics. It said that to have a 50% chance of at least one collision, you need to create a 2.71 quintillion UUIDs. This number is the equivalent of generating 1 billion UUIDs per second for 85 years. So after 85 years of producing a billion numbers a second, there is then a 50-50 chance that one of those numbers will be the same as one of the other numbers that has already been produced. So as you can see, pretty long odds. Another way to describe that is like this, that the probability to find a duplicate within 103 trillion numbers is actually one in a billion. So what this basically means, if I'm writing some software that needs a unique identifier for uh, something in a database, for example, I can generate one of these numbers just using random uh, ones and zeros, and the chances that it's gonna clash with another number in my database, or in fact with another number in any database in the world, is incredibly small. Now there are occasions where maybe this fact that you could have a collision is actually still not a very good idea. And so there are a couple of other ways that you can produce uh, UUIDs. One is you can take a string and then you can apply a hash function to it like MD5 or like SHA1. And then using the first 16 bytes of that hash, you generate the UUID. And that has the advantage that it's also always computable, which means if you put in the same string, you always get the same UUID. But if you want something that's going to be different every time, another way of doing it is to take the MAC address, which is the address, the physical address of your Ethernet card or of your Wi-Fi card, and then combining that with a date timestamp, the current seconds now, amalgamating it together, and that will give you a unique ID, because you know that a different computer with a different uh, network card in it will actually produce a different uh, UUID, even in exactly that same uh, moment, exactly that same split second. And then of course the next UUID I produce will be different because time has gone forward. Which actually reminds me, if you do want to hear about how MAC addresses work and how they control Ethernet, then please do let me know in the comments below and I'll think about making a video about that. So that's how we use 128-bit numbers to create unique IDs. But there are another couple of places that we use 128-bit numbers. Hopefully you've seen my video on network commands for IPv4 and IPv6. Now there I would have talked about IPv6 addresses and I would have mentioned that IPv6 addresses are actually 128-bit numbers. Now what I mentioned was that IPv4 addresses have run out because they're only 32 bits long, so we don't have enough of those anymore. But actually 128-bit numbers are as a lot of address space. In fact, it's been calculated that it's the same as the number of atoms on the surface of 100 planets 
that's how many addresses you can actually create using 128-bit addressing. So 128-bit addresses for TCP, uh, for IP version 6, uh, are expressed as a set of hexadecimal numbers, and they can be pretty long. Here is an example of one. But as you can see, that it can be a bit unwieldy, so actually you can shrink it down just a little bit, because if you have a segment of just zeros, that can be shortened down to just a zero, and any leading zeros inside of one of those little groups can also be removed. So here's that same number with the zeros removed, and you can see it's a little bit shorter. So there we go, another example of 128-bit numbers, this time for IPv6. Now the final place I'd like to mention where we use 128-bit numbers is inside of our CPUs in what's known as SIMD, Single Instruction Multiple Data Instructions. Now of course we know about 32-bit processors and 64-bit processors, but actually ever since kind of like SSE in the Intel processors, that's kind of what came after MMX, and ever since there's been NEON inside of the ARM processors, there have been these SIMD instructions that allow one operation to happen on multiple bits of data at once. So for example, if you wanted to multiply a matrix of numbers or a vector of numbers by let's say three, of course you could take the first one, you can multiply it by three, you can take the second one, you can multiply it by three, you can take the third one, you can multiply it by three, and so on and so on. But of course this all takes time because you have to do each one as an individual instruction. Wouldn't it be much more useful if you could say to the processor, hey, look, I've got some numbers here, let's say four numbers, and I want to multiply all of them by three in one go. Can you do that please? And then it goes, yes, I've got SIMD, single instruction, multiple data instructions. So therefore I can do the CPUs, I can do this all in one go for you. And so what happens is these often use 128 bit registers, which means they're super wide. Okay, and you can load up these registers with maybe let's say four 32-bit numbers or even more 16-bit numbers. And you can say, please multiply every one of those numbers by three. And of course, that's really good when you're doing multiplication of let's say matrices or adding matrices. In fact, there's a whole bunch of different mathematical areas where being able to multiply or add or do operations on multiple bits of data all at once makes it much, much faster. So inside of our 64-bit CPUs today, we actually have operations that are occurring at 128-bit, and that's using the uh, single instruction multiple data instructions. So there you go, your CPU inside your phone or inside your desktop is probably doing the occasional 128-bit calculation. So there we go, three examples of where we use 128-bit numbers. Unique uh, IDs, universally unique IDs, uh, IPv6 addresses, and these single instruction multiple data instructions that can work on 128-bit registers. Hello there, my name's Gary Sims and this is Gary Explains. I really hope you enjoyed this video and this look at 128-bit numbers. If you did enjoy the video, please do give it a thumbs up. Please also don't forget to subscribe and well, uh, that's it. I'll see you in the next one.